All right, guys, welcome back to Home Theater Gurus. This is episode nine. This episode is going to cover subwoofers. Nothing like episode seven where we were using, you know, Rumi Q Wizard and measuring and aligning subwoofers and actually looking at responses. This is going to be geared more towards the guy or girl that doesn't want to get into that. You know, something not quite so advanced, just basic, simple subwoofer setup, plate amp setup, where to put multiple subs and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so for placement here, we have a room. It's not to scale or anything like that. We, this doesn't need to be to scale. So let's go ahead and put our sofa or our uh, seating in the room. There we go. So when we're in a room that's rectangular, especially, there are certain positions of the subs or locations we can use that are known to be good. And what that means is it's gonna give you a consistent seat to seat response once they're properly aligned. Now that's key, they have to be properly aligned. So uh, these are gonna be based off the Harmon studies and a lot of work and a lot of the things that is used in professional home theater design is based on these studies. You know, the Harmon went in and, you know, measured a lot of different room positions and sub subwoofer placements in room and found locations that work well for smoothing, you know, peaks, not really peaks, but really smoothing nulls and getting a seat to seat consistency that, you know, so that everyone in the room and especially all the seats that matter, they're all hearing the same thing. Now, of course, if you've got, you know, eight seats and two of them are next to a wall or two of them are next to an opening, those seats are not going to sound like the other seats. There's nothing you can do about it. So those seats, sometimes you have to ignore a seat and that's just the way it has to be because if it's next to a, you know, a boundary, or an opening, it's just not going to sound like the other seats. It's just not going to happen. But anyway, so here we have like a rectangular room. So let's say we have two subs. All right, some known good positions are going to be front corners. Now you hear sometimes, you know, corners are bad. Corners are not bad. If your corners replacement, you know, results in it being muddy and slow, which is what we often hear, that's because you didn't finish, okay? You can't just throw a sub in a room and expect it to perform well. You know, you have to align them first. They have to be aligned. And then what happens in a corner is you, ex you excite all the room modes. So the base, you know, like this sub was designed, say, linear. You know, a, a sealed sub will roll off. A, you know, a ported sub is gonna be basically linear. It could even rise to its tuning response, and then it's gonna drop off. So if this sub is tuned to 20 hertz, you stick it in the corner, now from say, depending on how big the room is and where a room gain starts, from 30 hertz on up, I mean, it could just take off and have way too much output. And so that output's gonna sound slow and it's gonna sound muddy and overpowering. Well, what that sub needs is EQ to knock it back down. And once you knock it back down, it's gonna be nice and tight and you're gonna have a ton of headroom. So there's nothing at all wrong with corners. They're actually very, very good. And it can really help you, especially if you have like sealed subs, you know, where you don't have as much output below 30 hertz, where you're really having to either boost the subs, you know, the levels, you know, using your amplifier and EQ, or you're having to rely on room gain. You know, it can really, really help out in some situations. So anyway, enough about that. So front corners are good. You can also go with opposing front and rear corner. Oh, one other thing. When you have a sub set up like this, you have what's called a virtual sub. And that virtual sub is gonna be here in the middle. And it's falling off the wall there. So you have a room mode here, and this virtual sub is gonna fix that room mode. That's just something to kind of keep in mind. So when we have opposing front and rear corners, we have a virtual sub right between them. And so again, that same room mode. And then you have another room mode going this way. So it's going to fix two room modes, which is a good thing. We're, we're making the area of good sound larger by manipulating these subs around the room, you know, positioning them where in specific locations. When we put them in specific locations, we're going to make the area larger where we get good sound. Because right now, before you set these subs up, you've got room modes all through this room, like every half, quarter, one eighth you know, fraction or spots in these rooms, you know, room modes are cutting through like, like this. And the same thing this way. So when we place these subs, we're actually canceling out some of these room modes. And it gives us more options to find good base in the room. But we don't want to get too complicated with this video. So, 
that's good options for dual subs and also one quarter and three quarters. Those are also very good options, especially if you have like a baffle wall, you know, and you need to put your mains over here in the corners. Another thing about corners, they do excite room modes, as we said before, but with your mains there, you're going to be rolling them off to your subs. So there's nothing wrong with putting the mains there because those modal frequencies, you know, where they really start to build up bass, you're going to be cutting the mains off and rolling it to your subs by then anyway. So, so that's a perfectly fine place to put your mains in the corners, you know, because especially if it gets you intolerance and gets the right width you need, you really want that 60 degree spacing for your mains. But anyway, so this works really well. And again, that's going to put your virtual sub right in the middle. Canceling out that middle room mode there. All right, so let's say you have four subs, okay? What I have in my room, I have a sub in each corner. And now you've already seen, because you've probably seen episode seven, or if you haven't, you might want to go back and watch it. You see what's possible with four subs in a room. And you see how consistent my seat to see consistency is. I mean, here it is right here. I mean, that's uh, you're, if you beat that, you know, good luck. This is, you know, but that's, I can't really take all the credit. That's based on the Harman room mode, you know, study. So it works. So you've got four corners. You can also do half points of each wall. That's also a good, a good spot or good placement. And you can also do one quarter and three quarters on front and back wall. Okay, now that's going to be, you know, like a rectangular room. So you have a bedroom or a dedicated room, something that's, you know, doesn't have a lot of openings. You know, maybe one or two openings is fine, but it's something that's not really open to another room that's uh, not irregular shaped. You can use these locations as a really good starting point to lay out your room and lay out your subs. And I mean, if you've got like a dedicated room and I mean, there's, it's really, really symmetrical or a bedroom that you're converting that's really symmetrical, these are gonna work. I mean, it's, you don't really have to, uh, there's no guesswork involved. Like you, you, in my room, episode seven, you know, my room is really symmetrical. I designed it that way. I placed my seats where they needed to be. It was just, it was too easy. You know, it, it is too easy whenever everything is set up right and you're following, you know, the guidelines of, you know, things like the Harmon study and known placement options. So it makes it really easy and takes the guesswork out. Now, one thing on placement, whenever, you know, people use the crawl method, the crawl method is really a very, very poor method. And the reason is, if you're sitting on the couch right here, Okay, you've already seen in episode seven how much the response varies seat to seat. And so say you're, you've got your sub right here and you're crawling around right here and you find a really good spot where the bass sounds good right here. It sounds great because you're listening to music. Well, that, that's going to be some bass heavy music. Say it's hitting at 30 hertz. 30 hertz sounds great, okay? The only problem is when you put the sub there, this person right here is going to have a completely different response. The 30 hertz is not going to sound like it did sitting right here. And this guy, completely different. Their response is going to change all over the place. So the crawl method is basically, again, another way for sub companies to, you know, it's, they don't have a lot of choice. They've got to give you some method. And that's just what they give you. It's just heavily flawed. And they can kind of put it on the user, you know, end user. Some of them probably do tell you, you know, if it's a rectangular room, they give you some kind of idea of known good placements. But sub crawl method is very very flawed and another thing when you have dual subs is let's say you're listening to some bass heavy music and it's peaking at 30 hertz so you crawl around on the ground and you find a response that it's got a good peak at 30 hertz but let's say there's a there's a dip or a null at 50 hertz and you don't even realize it because you're not listening to 50 hertz or it's not really kicking at 50 hertz you know or anywhere you know, it could be 60 hertz, 70 hertz, but there could be a major issue in the response that you don't know about. But 30 hertz is sounding great because there's a peak there. So when you're doing that method, all you're doing is listening for peaks. That's really all you can do. So you can crawl all around the floor and you're going to find a couple of different spots that the peaks sound good. But especially with dual subs, you know, with one sub, there's one response to worry about. With dual subs, you don't, you're not looking for a flat response. And with dual subs, you're not looking for a response that had a peak where the first sub did. You know, the second sub, you've got a dip to fix. And that's what you should use it for. So the second sub, 
it may come in and look like this and it may even have a little dip here at 30 which that's okay because the other sub had an extra output at 30. you want something that's got some extra output where the other one had that dip because it can fix that dip if you can find a place which you could if you knew what you were looking for and so when you sum them you know the summed response is going to look you know maybe like this and so that summed response has no dips because you fixed them. But if you didn't realize that you had a dip there, you wouldn't know to fix that dip or you wouldn't know what location had extra output at that dip. Even if it was weak, you know, in the base area or at 30 hertz. So that's why the crawl method is extremely flawed. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a way to, you know, give the end user something to do, I guess, you know, but the sub manufacturer can kind of put it back on them. You know, you need to do this method, but I mean, it's, it's just extremely flawed. And to get that positive summation requires you to be able to align them, which you can't do by ear. You're going to have to use your, you know, your receiver or, you know, unless you want to do like episode seven where we aligned it ourselves. But to do that, we've got to be able to see the response, which requires like room EQ wizard or a program like that. So that's all I'm going to say about the crawl method. So now that you kind of have placement figured out, we're going to go over connecting the subwoofer. So you're going to have an LFE or a sub out on your receiver. You may have two sub outs, okay? Let's say your receiver was advertised as a 7.2.4, okay? What that means is that 0.2 means you have two sub outs. It's still mono. It's still a 7.1. If you've got 20 subs, it's still a 7.1 because it's a mono signal. So the 0.2 just means there's two outputs on the receiver. Now, hopefully those outputs are independent of each other and you can actually set delay between them and that would actually be like a real 0.2 capable receiver where it, you know, that just means it has independent, you know, control of each of those outputs. Now, sometimes the receivers will go cheap and they're just trying to, you know, boost up their specs to compete with other, you know, receivers that are better than they, you know, their receiver and the 0.2 doesn't mean anything. Like they're just fused together back there, basically a Y adapter that's built in. And the way you can tell is when you run your room correction, when it runs the first measurement, it's getting distances. If it pings each sub independently during the first measurement, then you know it's got two different, you know, sub outs, independent sub outs, and it's gonna be able to align those two subs, those two outputs. If you run it and it doesn't, and it pings both subs together during the first one, well, you know, you're not going to say you got screwed, but you got taken, sort of, because it doesn't have independent control between the two sub outs. It's just fused together inside the receiver. Now, after that, it's only it's going to ping them together because all the measurements after that first measurement, all it's doing is doing like a, a spatial EQ. It's sampling the area, the bubble around the main listening position for EQ. And that's that's all it's doing. So after the after the two, three, all those other measurements after one, it's going to be sweeping and pinging the subs together. So it's that first measurement that's going to key you in on whether or not you really have a 0.2 receiver with independent control of each sub. So in this video, I'm going to assume that most of you guys aren't using, you know, something like a mini DSP to align your subs, which, you know, I highly advise that. And that we do in episode seven. Now, if you were doing that, you would only use one sub out, but because you're going to rely on your receiver to align them, you're not going to use your ear. Your ear sucks. I hate to break it to you. You cannot do it by ear. And if you go back and watch episode seven, you're going to realize really quick is like, um, you can't do it by ear. You're going to get it. So uh, you're going to use both sub outs on your receiver because your receiver is going to be using an impulse measurement, which is basically a timing measurement to get, you know, when it first gets the signal from that sub, each sub on each channel to align the subwoofers and get them time aligned. Now, that's not nearly as good as what we're going to do on Episode 7 or what we did on Episode 7, but that's all you've got until you're ready to step up to REW and, you know, that's use your receiver. It's going to do a much better job than you can do by ear. So, you're going to use both of your sub outs coming out of your receiver. And you're going to go, of course, into your, your subs. Now, if you look at the back of your sub here, you've got different options. Like, here's just an example. Okay, now sometimes you're going to have an LFE in. And of course, that's where your RCA jack coming from your sub outs of your receiver is going to go. But let's say you don't have an LFE in or you don't have anything that says sub in. You need to look in your manual. You know, a lot of times it's going to just tell you to put it in maybe the right or the left input. 
Okay, and sometimes it's going to tell you to put it in both. Dayton has some amps like that. You know, it tells you to get a splitter. I'm not sure why it didn't come with a splitter, but it didn't. And plug it into both. So you're just going to Y, get a Y splitter and split into both inputs. And it does make a huge difference. Just look in your manual and see what it suggests. All right, now we're just going to look at some of these settings and I'm going to tell you where to set them. And then we're going to go back and I'm going to explain why. All right, the volume. The volume is not a volume. Like in this example, it says volume. Sometimes it's going to say gain. Gain is actually more correct than volume. They put volume on there to keep the phone from ringing. Okay, they get tired of people calling and saying, what is this gain? What do I do with this? You know, it confuses people. Well, volume confuses people too, really. It's very inaccurate. It is not a volume. So for that, I would just set it at half, 50%. And that way, once you calibrate your system, you always know that, you know, if somebody bumps it, you always know that that is your default setting. And we're going to discuss that in just a minute. Okay, your frequency. Now, on frequency, you're going to max this out. Sometimes you can even disable it. It'll have like a disable switch next to it. And that must be maxed out. Our receiver is going to set our crossover settings for us. We're not going to be doing it in the plate amp. Okay, now what that's for, I'm just going to tell you real quick. If you see like the high level inputs, those are for like the two channel guys. Say you have a sub by each main, you would run the wires, the speaker wires, not the RCA wires, but the speaker wires into the input and then back out of the output into your speaker, your main. And what that does is it's basically going to get the same signal that the main gets and you're going to use that crossover well, actually you're going to measure first with like Rumi Q wizard where you can see where that main begins to drop off and you're going to set your frequency to begin picking up where that main drops off and then you're going to use the phase to dial it in just right something you need measurements for it's not designed for the LFE input that's why we just disable it okay and then let's see then you have phase sometimes you have a phase knob that's variable Okay, now if you have that, you can actually do, like what we did in episode 7, you can actually do that without a mini DSP, some of it. It's not nearly as easy to do, but anyway, we're keeping this, this episode simple. So like if it says 0 and 180, just set it for 0. Your receiver is going to do whatever it has to do to align it. Even if it's behind you, a lot of times, you know, 180 may be the correct position. I mean, you can go ahead and do it, but the whole thinking that switch it to zero and see how it sounds, switch it to 180 and see how it sounds. Don't do that because even zero is not aligned because you can't align it. You know, all you're doing is listen for, for peaks and listening where the best peak is at, you know. You can't align it, so just switching it back and forth isn't really getting it aligned. It's just kind of picking the lesser of two evils. So just set it for zero and you're going to let your receiver align the sub to the other sub. And then once it does that, you're going to leave it alone because all you're going to do is take it out of phase if you adjust it. Okay, then you got an auto on switch. Auto just means it's waiting for the signal. You know, when it gets voltage from your receiver, it's going to turn on. That's all it means. And if you're, say, it won't turn on an auto, a lot of times it's because you've got that volume knob, that gain knob on your receiver, or I'm sorry, on your amp turned up too high. And so the receiver had to turn the voltage down so low that the plate amp doesn't even recognize it. It's not picking it up. It's not strong enough to turn the amp on. And we're going to get into that in just a second because that kind of ties in on what that knob is for. All right, so that's going to cover pretty much everything on your plate amp. Now, if you've got like an SVS and it's digital, it's going to be the same thing. Now, some of those SVSs and other brands even have EQ. Don't use the EQ unless you can measure because you don't know what you're doing. Okay, I mean, you can't see it. You really have to see it. Now, if you just like tweaking and you want to do it by ear, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're after accuracy, you really need to be able to see what's going on before you mess with stuff. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, some subwoofers have like or, or hybrids. They have ports you can plug. And so they will tell you to set EQ1, EQ2. And all they're doing is they're adding boost in that plate amp to compensate for the different tuning that you're that you're doing when you plug a port you change the tuning you know you're lowering the tuning so they're going to change the eq because they eq them kind of like baked in from the factory 
you know, so they sound good when the end user gets it. That's one little thing between DIY subs and the store-bought subs is we don't rely on EQ. It's also why our boxes are bigger. You know, our response will be flat to tuning without EQ. And some store-boughts are like that too, but with the hybrids, they do rely on a lot of EQ and some boosting to get a, a nice response. So the end user is happy, basically. Okay, now LFE. Now LFE is a discrete channel. Now. Everyone's heard of 5.1, 7.1, and that point 0.1 right there, that is the LFE channel. So LFE stands for low frequency effect. That's what it means. And basically, that's just where your low frequencies go or where they're mastered, you know, in the recording, you have certain information that's meant just for that channel. It doesn't go to any other speaker, it just goes to your subwoofer. And so that's why you're going to have the LFE out or the sub out, and it's going to go straight to your sub. And it's like I said, it's discrete, just like the front left is discrete. So, and the frequency response or the frequency bandwidth that could be on that channel is anywhere, you know, it could be down low and under 10 hertz, which is very rare. I mean, really, if you've got an in-room negative that goes down to negative 15 and not, not a, some people just say out, usable output, which is basically a useless term, it means nothing. Just because you hear a noise down there doesn't mean it's usable. You want like some, you, it needs to be as loud as the rest of the response. So negative three is usually what is the standard. So if you've got an in-room negative three of 15 hertz, that's pretty awesome. You're good to go. Even an in-room negative three of 20 hertz is great. Negative 15, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about going lower. You're good. So let's just say 15 hertz to 120 hertz. 120 hertz is the top of the LFE channel. And of course, it could be below 15. So that's the LFE channel. Now, bass management is when you have a speaker and you set it to small, and basically small means bass management on, doesn't mean anything bad about your speakers. And all that's gonna do is it's going to route the information below the crossover you set to the sub. And it's gonna use the LFE channel as like a highway to get there because it needs to find a route to get to your sub. And there's one sitting right there called the LFE channel. So it's different than the LFE, it just uses the same route to get to your sub. Now, why would you use LFE or why would you use a crossover and set your speaker to small if you have large speakers? Well, we saw in episode seven what happens when you have one source of modal or one source of bass. You know, your seat to seat consistency goes out the window, okay? Every seat sounds different. So if you've got a choice of letting your main, your left main play 60 hertz, you know, you're gonna, if you choose that, as your decision, you're going to have a different response at every seat. Everyone's going to hear something different. And you saw what happened, I and mean, here's what happens if you properly align your subs, every seat hears the same thing. I mean, I've got it there basically hearing the same thing up to 100, 120 hertz. So you're choosing quality when you set your speaker to small, assuming your subs are properly set up. You know, if you say that, you know, 60 hertz crossover sounds better or 40 hertz crossover sounds better, it's because your subs are jacked up. That's just the way it is. Something's wrong with your subs or your, your, your subs are not aligned to your mains. Something screwed up in your setup somewhere. So that would be why you would set your speakers to small. And in, you know, uh, professionally designed rooms, they're set to small because we want consistent seat to seat bass. And so you're basically, as soon as that bass is not directional, they're going to the sub. They're gonna cross over and get to that sub ASAP because that sub is gonna be several sources of bass that are all aligned and are gonna give us that seat to seat consistency that we want. So that's gonna be bass management. So it's any speaker set to small, you can set the crossover point. Usually 80 hertz is chosen just because that's where most you know kind of feel that bass is no longer directional. Now, if you've got your subs up front, you know, you can cross it over 100 hertz. I mean, it's really going to be hard to tell what sub it's coming out of, you know, when they're all up front or even behind you at some times. I mean, that's something you can play with the crossover point and see if maybe you can get it to 100 and you still can't tell. If so, you know, chances are you're going to have even a better conceit to see consistency, you know, up to 100 hertz than you would at 80 hertz because more of the content is being handled by the multiple subs. 
So that's probably it's getting a little too advanced there. So we're going to kind of leave it at that. So another thing to remember that LFE has a filter setting in the, in the receiver, okay, or your processor. It needs to be set no lower than 120 hertz because remember LFE is 15 to 120 hertz. If you set the LFE low pass filter, and that's what it's called, it LPF or it may say low pass filter, if you set it to 80 hertz, you're gonna get across, you're gonna set a filter in there in this LFE channel and you're gonna cut it short, you know. If you set it for 80, you're gonna lose a lot of output that should be there because it's encoded in that channel, but you can't hear it. And that's also why on your plate amp, I told you to max it out. You do not want that plate amp crossover and the plate amp is the amp on your sub to affect this at all. We want it to al allow our receiver to decide what goes to the sub. So, Another reason is if you set that at 80, not only do you affect the LFE channel and cut it off too, the way a crossover works, let's say here's your sub, and here is your main, let's see. <clears throat> so there's your sub, there's your main, and this is an 80 hertz crossover right here. Okay, so what happens is when you set your receiver to 80 hertz, like for your when you set a speaker to small and you're crossing that content from a speaker to a sub, it's gonna set the crossover at whatever point we set it for 80, so it's gonna roll the sub off and it's gonna roll that main off or that speaker off so that they intersect at 80 and the result is going to be a positive or a nice smooth response right across that point there. It's not gonna be a dip or anything, it's gonna be nice and smooth across it. So if you were to set your plate amp or your, your subs amp at 80 hertz as well and set an 80 hertz crossover in the receiver, now you have two crossovers set on the sub. So now it's gonna fall like this. And your response, your receiver is going to, uh, when it crosses it over, you know, it's gonna have a dip. You're gonna have weak base at that crossover point because you have two crossover set two slopes being you know being engaged on the subwoofer and you're pulling it down too much and it can't get a nice transition from main or speaker to subwoofer so that's all the more reason max out that crossover setting on your plate amp now if you've got speakers like def tech or definitive technology that have built-in subs with their you know they're self-powered if they have an lfe input and you can select it to LFE mode, you can use those as subs. And in that case, you would still set your speaker to small, but you're, you can use those subs that are built in by setting it to the LFE mode and just treat it like a sub. You'll just run that RCA right into it, just like another sub, and you'll actually have to calibrate it along with the subs, either through the auto setup or manually, however you're doing it. All right, let's talk about the volume or the gain knob that's on the plate amp. That is not a volume, okay? I know they say that, but that's just to keep them from the phone from ringing. And it's not really a gain, even though they call it that, it's actually an input attenuator. And what that does is it adds attenuation to the input signal coming from the receiver. And that allows the receiver to adjust its output voltage, okay? Because it needs to find a happy place for the output voltage. And it needs, you know, it doesn't want to clip the signal but it, you know, it needs to be strong enough to give you a good signal. You know, if you take the plate amp cross or the plate amp gain knob, turn it all the way up, all you're gonna do is force the receiver to have to turn its voltage down because it's gonna try to calibrate during auto calibration or auto setup, it's gonna try to calibrate everything for reference. So no matter where you put that volume knob or that gain knob, the receiver is just gonna compensate for it by adjusting its voltage to get the right output at the subwoofer or what it measures from all the subs in the room. So it is, does not mean your sub is more powerful because say you run Odyssey and it tells you to turn it down. It doesn't mean that. You know, a much smaller sub could have more output. It just means that your setting, you know, your knob was not adjusted properly and it needs you to turn it down so that, or get it intolerance. It usually will throw up, you know, get, it'll tell you to get the SPL intolerance and turn it green. It needs you to just adjust it so we can set its voltage properly. That's all it's doing. It's a tool. That knob is a tool to get the proper voltage out of your receiver or your processor. Full power 
and full output of your sub is available no matter where that knob is set. That knob has nothing to do with volume. Now yes, once it's set up you can go over there and turn it and it'll get louder if you turn it right or turn it clockwise. And that's just because you're reducing attenuation, removing attenuation from the input signal. That's all you're doing. You could do the same thing by just adjusting, increasing the voltage in the receiver by turning the sub trim up. You know, it's potato patata. You're not really making it a more powerful sub. You know, now if it's already been calibrated, you're taking it out of calibration because now it's louder than it should be. But that's okay too. I mean, subs are kind of one of those things you do by ear. If you like it a little hot, there's nothing wrong with it. You just need to understand, you know, thinking, the thinking that because you had to turn it down means it's a powerful subwoofer is, you know, nonsense. It doesn't mean that whatsoever. You know, you could have a home theater in a box and it could tell you to turn it down because you've got it in a corner, there's a room mode there, you know, or whatever. And it just needs you to, it needs to set its, its voltage settings. You know, it needs to get its settings set up properly, and that's, that's all it means. Okay, if you've seen episode 7, you understand that there is no way in the world you can align subs by ear. It's just not possible. I mean, if it is, I would sleep with some KY jelly because the aliens are going to come abduct you because you're not normal. It just doesn't work that way, okay? Rumichu wizard or something like that where you can measure is going to be needed to align subs, you know, yourself manually. And that's the way I prefer to do it. But if you're not, if you're not ready for that, it's totally fine. Use your receiver. It's going to send out an impulse, and that's what it's going to use is those impulse measurements to align the subs, to time align them. So just let your gear do its job. It's much, much more accurate than you're going to be by ear. And if something doesn't sound right, you know, try to run it again. Sometimes it gets it wrong, but the point is, you're helpless by ear. You can't beat measurements. I mean, it's just that you can't. If you don't believe me, go watch episode seven. Okay, so now just a little rundown. On your plate amp, we're gonna set the frequency all the way up. We're gonna disable it, okay? Max it out. The volume, the gain, maybe set it for 50%. Set it in a place where you can always go back. If someone bumps it, you can go back and set it where it needs to be because you know that's your default setting. and remember that has nothing to do with output doesn't take away from your output full power full output is available no matter where that's set and we're going to go into the lfe input if it doesn't have an lfe in stamped on it we're going to look in our manual to see exactly where we need to put our input it could be on the right the left or we could be told to get a splitter and use both phase set it for zero let our receiver do the work okay especially after our receiver does our auto setup don't go adjusting things. The reason is, say you flip that switch, okay, now you've taken them out of phase because the, the receiver actually set the phase for you. Say you set it, you may get a boost at 30 hertz, but it's probably going to cause nulls somewhere else. It's going to have negative summation between your two subs because you went and flipped that switch. And not only that, it also is going to take the mains and the subs out of phase because when you run the auto setup, your sub's distance is how it aligns mains to subs or your center to subs. If you go and mess with the distance of the mains or the distance of the center or the distance of the subs themselves, you've now taken those speakers out of alignment. So where their crossover point, remember, gives them a smooth transition here, you're going to cause issues around that point because now you've, in time, you've moved them, you know, not, in, not physically, but if you think of it in the time, domain you've now moved those speakers so don't jack with your settings in your receiver for distances especially the sub the sub not is the sub is not going to have the right distance it's not supposed to it's a time alignment not a distance alignment okay i think that's it on the back of the plate amps in your receiver low pass filter it needs to be set at 120 or higher. You can set it for 200, it doesn't really matter because the LFE only goes up to 120 anyway. It's kind of a goofy setting, it really shouldn't be there. Don't go any lower. Once you get your speaker set up, once the receiver aligns your subwoofers, especially if you have multiple subs, if you have one sub, I wouldn't worry about it too much because your seat to seat consistency is not gonna be great anyway. But if you've got dual subs, they're properly set up, hopefully you have a good seat to seat response. If that's true, Keep that crossover setting, set all of your speakers to small, keep the crossover setting at 80 hertz and don't go any lower. If you can bump it up to 100, 
and you don't have any audible, you know, you can't tell the, where the subs are located, keep it at 100. There's nothing wrong with that because you're not after bragging rights, you know, that I've got, you know, 13 foot towers and, you know, they go down to negative five hertz. Nobody cares. Okay, we're after a consistent seat to seat response and quality. We're not after bragging. A lot of people don't understand how this stuff works. So they don't want to set their speaker to small because, you know, it's like it hurts their, you know, you know, it hurts somewhere in there. You know, they feel a pain when they set that speaker they spent all this money on to small. Well, if you're after quality sound, you know, that's just what you're going to have to do. So set the speakers to small, set the crossovers at 80, maybe a little higher if you can, because we want a consistent seat to seat response. This is home theater. This is not two channel listening where we're just one person sitting in a room. So we have to think differently than like a two channel guy that's only worried about one seat sounding right. We want all the seats to sound good. We don't want to be the only one smiling in the room and our neighbor, you know, your wife, girlfriend, daughter, whoever, your kids are sitting there and they, they don't know what's going on and you're smiling with a goofy grin on your face. They think something's wrong with you. So we don't want that. Now, a lot of your receivers have something called like LFE plus mains or double bass. And what that's going to do is, let's say you set an 80 hertz crossover for your mains and you've got that engaged and something at 60 hertz happens on the screen. Your main is going to get treated like a full range speaker, so it's still going to play everything, but it's going to cross over to the sub at 80 hertz as if it was set to small. So it's going to be playing out of both at the same time. Well, whenever we align our subs, we're aligning the subs by themselves. So you see here, my response seat to seat, everybody's hearing the same thing. As soon as I throw another source of sound in there, like that main, if it was also playing a 60 hertz tone, that seat to seat right there goes out the window. Okay. It, I mean, now there's another speaker in there that is not aligned to all these other speakers to my subs. So I've basically, you know, thrown a wrench in it. Okay, so that's not really going to be good either. Now, sometimes people are like, oh, it sounds better. Well, the problem is when LFE hits, when there's something on the LFE channel, if you've got four subs, okay, that's four subs playing that are perfectly aligned. Seat to seat is perfect. Now something happens at 60 hertz on that main. Now you've got five sources of bass, my four subs and that main. So now that, but one of those speakers is not aligned to those subs. So now my seat to seat is not good so it goes back and forth to a good response bad response okay now here's a really good example of the lfe channel by itself and what happens when you set it to lfe plus mains or double bass so you see the blue line that's the lfe channel it's already been aligned There's, that's four subs they've already been aligned we have a really tight c to c consistency so anytime like if we set a speaker to small and roll it off to the subs Anything below our crossover point that we choose is going to get what we have at the blue line. So we know what we're getting, and we're getting really, really accurate bass. So if we were to select LFE plus main, and something was to happen on just the LFE channel, we would still get the blue line. But now when something happens on the mains, or either one of the mains, because we've selected LFE plus main, we'll get the red line. Because now that main is being thrown in and playing along with the subs and so now it's unpredictable and you see what we have now all of a sudden we have a response that's in no way accurate because there's another speaker that's playing with our main our uh, subs you know our subs that we spent all that time getting them calibrated and getting them set up right now we're just slinging a wrench into them and this is what we get and now keep in mind that my mains their htm 12s they only they're tuned for like 7 60 70 hertz or they don't go that low so that's why around you know 50 hertz it starts picking back up and you know because it's really just the the lfe or just the subs playing if you had some mains that went lower that nasty response would go much lower than what you see here it would look even worse because it would be affecting more of the lfe or more of the subs than what you see here but i mean that's bad right there i mean that's that's horrible what we've done to that response by selecting LFE plus mains. So it's much better just to not use that. Just leave it at small and let the subs handle everything because you know the subs are going to be accurate and they're predictable because you've measured them. You know, if you've measured them, like I said, episode seven, if not, at least you know if it's in a rectangular room, 
you can set them up properly and rely on your receiver and hopefully it's going to do a good job so and again some people you know will say well it sounds better when i use that when it's engaged if that's the case again something's wrong with your subs you know in your sub region nothing should sound better than multiple subs with a seat to seat consistency that's really tight i mean nothing should be able to beat that okay you can put a house curve on it tailor the sound just how you want if it sounds better you know set to large or set to double bass or anything like that you need to look at them you probably got dips and nulls or you've got some peaks that were knocked down because maybe you don't have sub eq in your eq system software you know you need to make sure that your processor is able to eq the subs that's really important too for knocking down those you know those excessive bass that you may have by putting your speaker even next to a wall can ex excite room modes and makes it kind of bass heavy you know you need eq in the motor region the bass region All right, guys, that's going to be it for this episode. I think next episode we're going to go over room modes, and that's going to help us decide where we can sit so that we stay out of the room mode issues that are going to be above the subs. Because remember, in the sub region, we can fix those room modes with sub location or properly aligned multiple subs. But above the subs, you know, the room's going to dominate, and there's not much we can do about it, so we want to avoid them. So we're going to learn how to do that. That's going to be it for this episode, guys. I'm going to leave you all with a bunch of awesome subscriber room picks. Enjoy.